Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for another epic debate. This is going to be a lot of fun, folks. Want to let you know, if it's your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we have many more debates coming up. So, for example, you'll see at the bottom right of your screen, tomorrow night we're actually having a debate on the problem of evil. That'll have Skylar Fiction and Reformed Boy. So that should be a lot of fun. And also want to let you know, we're a neutral platform, which means we don't make any particular videos that are taking one one particular side after the debate or anything like that, that is ultimately up for the debaters to make their case and then for you in the audience to be the judge. So we're very excited as today we're going to have a pretty flexible, easygoing format, a lot of conversation. It's going to start with a 10 minute opening from Nephilim Free, you see on your right with the green laser eyes. He will be arguing that the Ark was a seaworthy vessel, among other things. And then Erica will have her 10 minute statement where she will be more more skeptical regarding that as well as the you could say after effects after the flood then we'll have open conversation for about 45 minutes to 60 minutes and then Q&A so if you have a question fire it into the old live chat and if you tag me with an at modern day debate it makes it easier for me to get every single question in the list as I try to do that and Super Chat is also an option, in which case you can not only ask a question, but if you want, you can actually make a comment during the question and answer, to which the speakers would, of course, get a chance to respond to. It will also push your question or comment to the top of the list for the Q&A. And with that, we are going to turn it over. But I do want to say, first, I am so thankful to have our guests here. This is going to be a lot of fun tonight. And so, Neff... Thrilled to have you. The floor for your opening statement is all yours. Okay, so, so, uh, all right. So people say, "Oh, Noah's Ark wouldn't wouldn't be strong enough," you know, uh, <clears throat> couldn't do what it had to do. These are gulams, which are boards that are glued together. They're seventy-two feet long by six inches, and these engineers are putting them through a test. They're going to see how strong they are. Remember, these are only six inches wide. 72 feet long and six inches wide, just six inches. Let's see when they break. There, there it goes. How much pressure did it take to break these six inch wide boards, four feet tall, six inches wide? How much pressure? Take a wild guess. Take a guess. 72,000 pounds. 72,000 pounds the ark was huge made of much more timber than that history records the ark was a real the flood was a real thing uh, i'm not going to read these to you uh Barossus, the famous uh, chaldean uh historian uh, wrote of it uh christostom wrote of it in three to four hundred a.d uh epiphanus of salimus wrote it wrote of it they said the the flood was a real event isadora of seville wrote of it Julius uh, Flavius, uh, Titus Flavius Josephus wrote of it. Mantheo wrote of it, 300 BC. Nicholas of Damascus in the first century. Theophilus in, a, in the second century. This is a replica of Noah's Ark. It wasn't built the same way as Noah's Ark. That's roughly the size of the smallest measure which Noah's Ark could be using a modern human cubit or an Egyptian cubit. Noah would have used his cubit Noah was bigger than a modern man, like every other creature in the fossil record proves. Before the flood, creatures were bigger. Noah's cubit would have been bigger. The ark would have been 600 meters long. Was it strong? Well, how much interior space did it have? This is a warehouse in Tupelo, Mississippi. 300,000 square feet. You need three of those, at least, to fill the smallest size of Noah's ark could have been. Can you get, nobody knows what, what the, the limits to variation are, but we see it all the time. Could Noah have brought enough creatures on the ark? Well, the answer is absolutely. The interior space of the smallest measurement of Noah's ark would have had 646,800 square feet. It had three floors. Noah could have had one floor for his kids and his family to play football while the others had held the animals food and fresh water now people say you can't make a ship that big out of wood and it will not float it won't work it'll break apart that's not so Zheng ha did it in 11 and 1411 uh, ce Zheng ha the right hand man of the chinese emperor built a ship the size of noah's ark and sailed all the way to india and the coast of africa 
and it was made of wood, and it would not have been made as strongly or stoutly as Noah's Ark. There's no way. But you can see the illustration there. Zheng Ha's flagship was roughly the size of Noah's Ark. Remember, I say Noah's Ark was even bigger. So it was roughly the size of Zheng Ha's flagship, and that ship was quite seaworthy, went all the way to India and Africa and back. It was a wooden box, the strongest kind of construction you could put in the water. Uh, so uh, um, an 18 wheeler weighs 70 to 80,000 pounds when it's fully loaded. Those timbers you saw break would have supported an entire 18 wheeler completely loaded with merchandise before it gave way. That's strong, very strong. Could Noah have had uh, trees to make timbers big enough to make a ship that was even stronger than what most people think? Absolutely. There are humongous trees on this earth. If you cut away all the extraneous parts in the bark, you could easily have timbers 10 feet by 10 feet square. How many pounds would that support? If six, if four feet tall by six inch wide timbers will so will hold 72,000 pounds. What if you had a 10 foot by 10 foot by 50 foot timber? You do the math. A lot of weight. One timber. Noah would have made the ark out of numerous timbers. Uh, Noah's ark was just uh, uh, the Disney Wonder cruise ship weighs 83,000 tons. Uh, just 46 beams of Noah's Ark, if they were made from the biggest parts of the largest trees, would support that entire ship. Just 46 of them would hold up that entire ship. Now, a, a North Korean world-class shipbuilding in, uh, corporation in North Korea, uh, South Korea, I'm sorry, was approached by a creationist organization and asked to analyze Noah's Ark as a seaworthy vehicle. They did so, and they found that it would be more seaworthy than any modern ship. Because of its six to one dimensions, it would be uh, more seaworthy and more stable on the ocean than any modern ship. Only in modern times did man start building ships to a six to one ratio. If you do the math and what the Bible, how the Bible describes Noah's Ark, it was six to one ratio. That's the most stable dimensions you can make a ship out of to keep it from capsizing. So Noah's Ark would have been, and absolutely would have been, a, 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 a strong ship, uh, ocean-going vessel. Now, people might say, well, uh, Noah's Ark couldn't sustain the, the, you're talking about a cataclysmic event. Well, yes, it was a cataclysmic event. And so how did Noah's Ark and the animals survive during such a cataclysmic event? Well, the truth is, I'm just going to be honest. I don't exactly know, but I know this. The ship that he was in was the most stable kind of ship that can possibly be made. A, a, a box, six to one ratio, made out of immense timbers, which would have been extremely strong. The ocean wouldn't have broken it apart. Um, and so uh, how did he survive? Well, uh, I, I assume that uh, that it was uh, it was simply able to be washed over by tidal waves and, and survive or ride them out, ride over the top of them, most likely. It, it probably wouldn't have been hit by a tidal wave. It would ride out a tidal wave. But the truth is, it obviously happened. We have the profound evidence of the Noahic flood in geology, the fossil record. It, it, the fossil record, as it's called, is a record of the flood. It's millions, it's actually trillions of creatures that are rapidly buried. You cannot get a fossil unless the organism is rapidly buried, sealed away from oxygen, predators, scavengers, and uh, aerobic bacteria and sunlight. You have to bury a creature fast in order to get a fossil. Even modern day geologists all agree, and paleontologists, an organism must be buried rapidly to get a, uh, or it will not fossilize. The oceans of the earth today do not have the mineral content necessary to create the fossil record. Why do we have a fossil record? Because during the flood, the minerals in the oceans were swelled up and they were mixed in. And you have minerals pouring out of the earth into, onto the, into the oceans on the earth and materials on one part of the continent being sloshed over to the other side of the continent, bringing minerals with them. That's why we have a fossil record. If the oceans of the earth were as crystal clear as they are today, 
there would be no fossil record. The only thing that can possibly explain a fossil record is highly mineralized water. The oceans of the earth today are relatively clear. They do not possess anywhere near the mineral content necessary to make fossils. Now, if uniformitarianism is true, that's the way the oceans have always been, incapable of making fossils. But the flood explains it because you have a cataclysmic event where minerals are immensely mixed up with the ocean waters and uh, bring those minerals to the sediments to create the fossil record. Without that, no fossil record. Uniformitarianism can't explain a fossil record. Only the flood of Noah can because the oceans today are supposedly like the oceans were 50 or 150, 350 million years ago and relatively clear. If that were the case, no fossil record. Not going to happen. No fossilization. Only a cataclysmic flood can explain the fossil record. So I think I've shown plenty of reason to believe the ocean was a strong enough vessel. You know, it would have made it out of the mass of timbers. The trees for that exist on the earth, always have. Uh, testing shows that the, the, the wood necessary would have certainly been strong enough. It was made to the right dimensions, out of the right stuff. And uh, the extraneous evidence, historical evidence, all shows that it happened. Could Noah have taken the right number of animals on there? Well, evolutionists constantly repeat this ridiculous uh, um, jargon. Well, there's 1.1 billion fa uh, uh, species on Earth. How did Noah fit all of them on there? How many times do creationists have to explain to evolutionists? Noah only had to bring baronins. He only had to bring kinds. He didn't have to bring uh, nine and 100 varieties of deer, just two deer. That's all. And so when you whittle it down to kinds or bearmans, which nobody can do with, with absolute precision any more than evolutionists can accurately define what a species is, um, there was plenty of space on the ark for the eight to 12,000 kinds of originally created creatures. So I think that's uh, enough. I think that concludes my opening statement. Eric, I thanks so much for being here. It's always good to have you. And the floor is all yours for your opening statement. We're kind of casting a broad net with this whole topic. So I think we're going to have some very fun discussions on a variety of different things. And I've co I'm covering some things that are a bit different from, from what Neff did. So the Noachian deluge, we all know about it. In Genesis 6, God basically uh, gets discontented with the evil of the world, so he floods it. And um, he finds flavor with Noah and his folks. So he's like, build an ark and take two of every animal and you guys are going to be good. So what is problematic and what is not? So for, for me personally, a localized flood that has been ingrained in the cultural memories of areas of Mesopotamia, I don't have an issue with that. It's not limited to a YEC time frame, so it's not problematic. But a global flood that covers the entire Earth and is, of course, limited to the YEC time frame is highly problematic. And we're going to talk about a few reasons why now. So what is wrong with the global flood in a 6,000-year time frame? Everything. A lot of stuff. <laughs> so the creationist model. Creationists suppose that the following occurred during Noah's flood, which lasted around one year. Now, there, there's some give and take here, depending on your individual thoughts, but this is a generalization. So they suppose all rock layers in the geologic column, uh, barring the basement granite, which is Precambrian in nature, were laid down, and all tectonic plates moved from their supercontinent position to the current arrangement. They also say that all fossils in those layers were also deposited, deposited there during the flood, and that all non-human animals today descend from the pairs that were taken on the ark. All humans today also descend from those that disembark the ark, which is about eight humans. So let's talk about these geology problems. This is one of my favorites. This is the White Cliffs of Dover in the background because we are going to talk about limestone. So limestone, among other minerals, is made up from the skeletons and shells of trillions upon trillions of marine microorganisms. Now, 10% of all sedimentary rock is made of limestone, of which most is marine in nature. So that would be deposited by the flood, of course. Limestone requires warm and calm waters to deposit, not those of the biggest global catastrophe of all time. It, it actually deposits at a rate of approximately 1.5 times 10 raised 15 grams of calcium carbonate or limestone each year on the ocean floor. So a deposition rate 10 times as high as this for 5,000 years before the flood would still only account for less than 0.02% of the limestone deposits, deposits that we have today. But the problems get worse. You might say, but the layers can be deposited quickly. And, you know, creationists like to link several papers on mudflume experiments and things of that nature. But these papers concern mudstone, of course, and shale. Mudstone and shale are drastically different from limestone, which is made up of microfossils and deposit much faster. 
So um, you might say, well, when they experiment once, then it'll work. But nope, that's not true either, because when layers are rapidly deposited, they uh, have identifiable features called flocules in them. Um, and we don't find any limestone limestone um, layers that are you know, hundreds of feet thick with any flocules in them. Actually, we don't find very many sedimentary layers at all with flocules, which is very problematic for, for bringing up these mud flume experiments done by Colorado and Indiana University. So the lowdown on layers. So why do we find enormous limestone layers which require calm and warm waters to deposit incredibly slowly with no known exception in between coarser material that deposits much faster according to all modern observations? It's sand toy logic, right? Um, layers deposit in order to, if they're all being deposited at once in a mixed up jumbled scenario such as a global flood, well you should have one big band of limestone at the top. Um, and of course, that even that is impossible, at least of course, to what we know now, because limestone can't deposit quickly by, by its very nature. Now that was a specific example, but we could also talk about, talk about chalk layers, which deposit incredibly slowly in and of themselves. In the time of the flood, you would maybe get half a meter of chalk. We could talk about angular unconformities, where there's no quick mechanism for, for them to form, or granite batholiths, which are essentially shoots of, of fiery hot granite that are injected into higher strata thanks to heat, pressure, and time, and much, much more. There have been some cool simulation experiments, by the way, on that that, that uh, is supportive. So we could look about radiometric decay. Now, why am I bringing up radiometric decay in a conversation about Noah's flood? Well, because it creates an enormous heat problem along with very quick continental movement. Uh, because obviously if you're working with 6,000 years or even less in, in accordance with the flood, you're basically having to cram 4.8 billion years of decay into the flood um, for whatever reason, that's usually what is done. But the radiometric decay law, radioactive decay law is a firm law in physics. Um, it, it essentially covers how things decay and decay rates don't change in meaningful ways in nature on our planet, according to all current thought. Creationists are at a loss on this themselves. I've, I've mentioned the rate group time and time again, who admitted that younger position cannot be reconciled with the scientific data without ex assuming exotic solutions will be found in the future. But this is still the case because in 2018, the International Conference of Creation Research admitted that the heat from content continental movement sedimentation and accelerated decay would be enough to melt the Earth's crust and boil off its oceans 28 times over. We need to let this sink in. This is a creationist organization that is admitting that there is currently no solution to this enormous heat problem from all the things that need to happen during that time frame. Noah's boat would not be able to survive that no matter how robust it is. Ah, but water would mitigate the heat. It absolutely 100% would not mitigate the heat according to both secular and creationist sources. So under the catastrophic plate tectonics model that AIG and ICR subscribe to, the oceans would be vaporized as each and every kilometer was heated to 70,000 degrees Celsius. But under the hydroplate model, which is by Walt Brown, the problem is even greater because they have all of the same problems as catastrophic plate tectonics, but they also believe that all meteor uh, craters that we have today are the result of Earth's ejecta from the floods of the fountains of the deep opening up falling back down to the planet. Now, just the energy in releasing chunks of Earth ejecta that would then have to fall back down, not even them hitting the Earth on a, upon re-entry, is equivalent to over 20 trillion hydrogen bombs. That was uh, calculated by Sharp in 2005. Now, we could also talk about how, how financially viable radiometric dating is, which of course it very much is. There was a group that tried to use flood geology, the Zion Oil, and they quickly switched over to conventional geology. Um, so the heat problem for accelerated decay and plate tectonics during a year period makes it impossible for even the most robust micro microorganisms to survive, let alone a wooden boat full of life, full stop. But there are also some fossil problems with the flood. So we could talk about the order. There is no rabbit in the Cambrian, right? Uh, fossil specimens are sorted in order from basal to complex emergence. And this evolutionary order, um, you know, this is evolutionary order and creationists of course don't have an explanation for this. Um, or rather they do, but they're not very good. So this first one is the density sort of hydrologic sorting hypothesis, which suggests that we find animals that are sorted by their weight. Um, so heavy things are, are more at the bottom and lighter things are of course at the top. Um, but this doesn't work because we find basilosaurs and mosasaurs in drastically different layers, despite being around the same size and occupying the exact same niche. Same thing with sparrows and small uh, pterodactyls, which of course occupy uh, the Pleistocene and the Triassic respectively. Well, what about ecologic sorting? Well, that doesn't really work either because what we should find if ecologic sorting is a thing is um, geologic columns spanning flood layers in locations of the world with only dinosaurs or only mammals or only therapsids, but we don't. We find, um, we find some you know, vastly different animals separated by geologic time, not spatial, uh, spatial area. 
We talk about ecology problems. Look at these adorable Japanese macaques. How did they get there? How did they get to Japan after the flood? Because here's some, some uh, uh, a nice map that shows where our monkeys and apes are today. So did Noah take a single progenitor primate on to yield all the old and new world monkeys and the hominoids? Did he take one of each, you know, one of each kind? How did each pair get to the respective continents or countries? Now you might say, well, rafting, evolutionists suggest rafting. Uh, that is the conventional scientific explanation for, for getting to the new world, but that's when you have enormous populations of, of old world monkeys to work with, not a single pair. Then we finally have the anthropology problems. So look at all of the flood myths, you might say. Floods are far from the only shared mythos in human culture. We have demigods, shapeshifters, unique chimera monsters, and animal-human hybrids that are also, also near universal. But the point is, the flood myth isn't even universal. Egypt, one very close country that according to YECs would have been relatively close uh, after the Tower of Babel, lacks a global flood myth. Now, Neff has proposed in a previous conversation that, that no, that's not true. Manetho did propose that there was a global flood. Um, but it's actually a quote mine um, from Nelson, N perhaps not intentional by Neff, but certainly intentional by Nelson. It's taken from a creationist source that is pulled from yet another older creationist source. And when you go back to the actual original source, which is, of course, the Book of the Dead, you find out that it's not a global flood that's referred to, but a vague catastrophe that has no indication that there is water involved at all. So this is from a, a book that covered the Book of the Dead, um, which says, you know, it, it actually is quite, quite savage to the, to the quote miners. There's also a problem with the Egyptian chronology. So the beginning of the Old Kingdom was in 2686 BCE in Giza. You know, they were built by three different pharaohs from 2550 to 2490 BCE. Now, AIG has the flood at 2348, so we've got one of two options. Either the pyramids survived the global flood, which is, I find that very hard to believe, considering in conventional science they're falling apart without a, without a global flood, um, or they were built after, and Egyptian chronology is entirely wrong. But that's kind of difficult because even if we go with the David Roll chronology, which is the one AIG, AIG uses, at the time Egypt was founded, you would have 2,048 people in the entire world. It's just not doubling fast enough to have enough people to build the pyramids of Giza, even by their own date. And if you up the population growth so that there are enough people, why did it eventually slow down? If, if, if it was that fast at one point, it, we should have trillions of people on the planet now. Uh, that's a little bit of hyperbole, but quite a few people. Um, so, so these are some of our issues. So essentially what I think Neff has to do to convince me in this conversation is provide an experimental or observational basis for quickly depositing limestone, chalk, and angular unconformities, as well as granite batholiths. I would also like to see a mechanism, perhaps, it doesn't have to be even peer reviewed, just, just what are his thoughts on a mechanism to explain the lack of large scale mixing of mammals of the Paleozoic and, or mammals and Paleozoic versus Mesozoic animals. We also need to see uh, a dispersal pattern and population growth rate that can account for the animals in their current location and human populations in their post flood locations. So providing a feasible wooden boat that could float in the current seas is not at all equivalent to a seaworthy wooden boat in the world's worst catastrophe. Um, so that's, that's all I got for you guys. Thanks for listening. Um, Erica, I'm surprised you brought up Manitho. Uh, you cherry picked the one guy that didn't mention that the flood was global, although he did mention uh, a, a catastrophic event when so many historians, as I pointed out in my opening statement, do mention the, the flood is global, even pre uh, even uh, pre Christ uh, historians. I, th I think that's an example of. Uh, uh, of cherry picking. You mentioned how do macaques get to migration? You admitted that the creationist explanation of rafting works, and the secular camp even proposes that very same thing. For example, monkeys live in South Africa, India, and Japan, but how did they get to, to um, how did they get to South Africa if they evolved millions of years ago? Uh, how did they get to South America if they existed in Africa? So me, you gave the okay, explanation so to that. A lot of issues. When we have a chance, we'll kick it over to Erica just to answer some of those. Yeah, sure. I just want to make sure that I can keep track of the questions. I don't want to get lost in the in, in sort of the conversation because I, I do want to make sure that we get like a, I don't want to overload you with questions and I don't want to be overloaded with questions either. Um, so the reason I picked Manitho of all of those is because I think it's especially relevant, even more so than the others. Most of the other sources were from uh, groups that had very close ties to the Hebrew people and would have had that, that sort of myth ingrained in them through cultural transfusion. Um, I just find it very interesting that Egypt, which was, it's meant it's right there. I mean, even according to, to uh, 
classic biblical scholars like the Hebrews and the Egyptians did interact. Even they don't have this myth, which which I find to be very interesting. I, I noted that you did have many others. I noted that they were all in that Mesopotamian area and also that there was no one from China, there was no one from South America or North America when there were people at that time. As for the second one, again, I, that, I, as I mentioned in my presentation, I don't find rafting to be a problem when you've got plenty of monkeys. But if you've got one pair of monkeys that needs to get across tumultuous seas, I mean, I don't, I haven't ever met a, a single um, primatologist who thinks that there was one rafting event that seeded all of South America with monkeys. Well, that's just your, can. well, that's just based on your, your, your paradigm that there had to be a large, you're presuming that, that, that it, and evolution has presumed this and that and the other about there's not enough time. The problem is there's not enough time for evolution. Um, so you, you admit that rafting is a plausible explanation uh, for continue. the, for, 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 well, I, as I pointed out. Uh, the secular scientists acknowledge that the rafting is the plausible explanation for why we have monkeys in South America because they evolved allegedly in in Africa millions of years before they got to South America. So yes, how did they get there? Yeah. And the secular camp admits rafting is the likely explanation. So if Thank they'll you. accept that rafting is the likely explanation for that, now you're cherry picking. So. You also said, um, you said limestone is a problem for the creationist. I say it's not a problem for the creationist. It's pr uh, produced, uh, comprised predominantly of calcium carbonate, which is the stuff that a fossil is made of. So uh, I, I think there was plenty of uh, sea life at, prior to the flood, such as coccolithophores, uh, that could have been transformed by heat uh, to uh, and other sea creatures uh, that could have provided the limestone. Uh, okay, let me I, just I, say that really quick. And, and, so, so with and, the limestone, you know, you do know that limestone, calcium carbonate, requires cold water to, to actually fall out, not hot water. So if you have hot water that comes in and vaporizes all of these organisms, turning them into calcium carbonate, which, by the way, it wouldn't be nearly enough to create the, the walls that we have today, even then, now you have a new problem because you're invoking hot water for, for vaporization, and now you need cold water for deposition. Well, limestone evolutionists have lots of lots of presumptions about this and that can't happen. A beautiful example is, is a, a dolomite. Uh, dolomite can be created in tiny amounts in the laboratory, and yet the Alps in Italy are covered with mega feet of this stuff. And there's no plausible explanation in uniformitarianism for the for the production of all that dolomite Listen, it, it, I'm without without I'm without without, without uh, cat some kind of catastrophic process. I, so, first of all, I don't I don't know that that's the case. I would like to see some some work on that from the creationists or from the secular sources as to why. Uniformitarianism wouldn't be able to explain that, but but the bigger point is I'm not talking about dolomite. I'm talking about limestone, which is I understand. I'm just problem. I'm just pointing out that a, a, a evolutionist uniformitarianist presumptions about this, that, and the other have, have many problems. I'd love to see empirical science that verifies limestone can't have been a massive amounts of limestone can't have been created hey, you know, during the flood. You know, I've never seen that. I, I'm with you on that, except I linked it in my in my presentation. So you've got Oldenburg uh, in 1955. You've got several different creationist resources that have looked into this with, with flume experiments and the like. And they're unable to find any singular means. In, I mean, creationists have conferences every year where they discuss some of the problems. And limestone has been brought up frequently. Like, they admit that there's an issue here. Um, so I don't know... I don't know why. I mean, they're OK with just saying, hey, we don't have an answer to this yet. Maybe we'll find one in the future, because um, that seems to be what, what the guys like Snelling, who's like an actual geologist, he's got a, a PhD. And of course, you and I don't. I, I can't speak for you. I don't have a PhD. And I'm just pointing out that, that when it comes to rock formation, the secular camp has their own uh, set of problems. So not knowing the mechanism by which the limestone of the earth was created during the flood, uh, I would say that you have a problem for it, for uniformitarianism too, especially when you find limestone, uh, sedimentary uh, sedimentary strata of limestone uh, wedged in between other sedimentary strata, and the boundary between them is paper thin. Ooh, which I, cannot, I was which let, let me finish a point. Let me finish a point. And the and the boundary between them is paper thin, which cannot have been produced by uniformitarianism, because we know from laboratory, observable, testable, real science that 
Sedimentary strata are produced by rapidly moving water, and that's why they have a fine, distinct boundary. Okay, if uniformitarianism, I... hold on, if uniformitarianism were true, then the materials of one strata, which uh, would gradiate from predominantly one material to another, it would gradiate over time as the environment made one available and then stopped providing it slowly and providing another. We don't see the gradation in the geologic column. This verifies any, any layer of limestone you find that's got a fine, distinct boundary between it and the strata above or below it was created during the flood. Okay. Uniformitarianism cannot explain Is it cool, is it cool if I take the same amount of time to respond to that? Yes. Okay, so in response to that, I was hoping you would bring up bedding because you brought that up in, in your conversation with Corp several times, and um, or rather, sorry, paper thin layers, which are bedding. Um, this, this is observed today in very like specific examples. Anytime we see anything that is deposited, there's paper thin layers because that's called bedding. That's just right. a fact. Rapidly de One deposited, yeah. right? Not, not, not rapidly. It happens in limestone too. Check out the Inui Talk Atoll. It happens there as well. This is real life. You can go out and snorkel and see it with your very own eyes. Uh, are you that's saying we are observed? Okay. 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 So hold on a second. Hold on a second. I, I do want to. I, 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 I want to give. I want to give Erica the same amount of time to respond. Yes, I should. I, I, I want to make sure we get a good back and forth. But but since you've mentioned quite a bit, I want to respond to all of it to the best of my ability. Um, but yes, all of those flume experiments that you just mentioned that that prove that things deposit rapidly, absolutely have 100 percent zero bearing on how limestone or chalk, for that matter, deposits by the admission of the creationists themselves. So if you if you can you can say say that maybe they'll come up with a solution in the future, but what you can't say is that all geologists including the ones that agree with you are wrong and that limestone deposits rapidly when there has been zero experimentation to even suggest that it could. I don't have a problem with there being something that's difficult to explain. Uniformitarianists have a lot that's difficult to explain. Dolomite is one of them. But you said something very uh, strange to me. You said you can go snorkeling and see the limestone for yourself. What do you see? Because, listen, are you telling us that you can observe limestone form over vast periods of time? Because we can't do that. What we can see is limestone in the geologic column with a paper-thin boundary between this, it and the materials above and below it, which is something verified by observable, testable, repeatable science in the laboratory. Can only, it happens only with rapidly moving water. So, Erica, I hate to tell you, anytime you find a strata, if it's limestone or any other, and it has a fine, flat boundary between it and the strata below it and above it, it can't have been produced by uniformitarianism. It's okay, not so to, possible. To okay. to that. There, there's other things that you mentioned I want okay. to bring up. I don't okay. want to just, I don't want to talk about limestone for 40 minutes. Uh, evolutionists love to carry on and on and on and on and on and on and on about one thing, but I'm not going to do that in this debate. Sure. You mentioned sure. flocculites. Hold on one right second. That you, you, can you, you mentioned flocculites, which are uh, lightning bolts. Okay, hold on a second, Neff. So just because there are a lot of different points uh, kind of going at once, is if we could maybe do fewer points at a time, like work ourselves down to like one or two at most, just because it's sometimes uh, hard for everybody to keep track of all the different ideas going on. Yeah, okay. I, I just don't want to de debate limestone for three. You don't minutes. have to. I'll yeah. say one last thing about how they measure how limestone deposits today. It was done in 1955. And they straight up went out there to areas where limestone frequently deposits, that is areas with a lot of uh, uh, um, microorganisms in the water. And you can just stick a ruler down there. Like you can just put a ruler down and come back in a year and you're going to have, you know, X amount of limestone. And you do that every year for about 10 years and then you come up with an average. And that's how you get the average deposition. The funny thing is, is that over the course of many of those years, the conditions, the weather, the, the tides, they all change. And yet you still get the same average right for the entire year that is to stay limestone deposit slowly now please full fuels let us let us continue yeah so you you think though the environment's constantly changing the rate of deposition for limestone is going to remain the same for millions and millions of years i don't see that but you mentioned flocculites uh these are lightning bolts that strike the earth and they create uh, a, a a rock inside the earth um, that's shaped like the lightning bolt the problem for those in uniformitarianism is where are they 
because we find virtually none of them in the geologic column. Now, if any place in the geologic column in the uniformitarianist's mind was ever the surface of the Earth for thousands and thousands of years, there should be trillions of flocculites because lightning's been striking the earth billions of times a year all over the earth. It doesn't make sense. The absence of flocculites in the geologic column is a problem for you. It doesn't, it, it fits, if the strata were formed during a cataclysmic event, we would expect there to be an absence, uh, a, a nearly a complete absence of flocculites in the geologic column. And that's what we see. We see flocculites only in the upper strata. We don't find them all the way down through the geologic column. Why? Because those strata weren't there for millions of years. So, that's why they're not there. Okay. If so, we're going um, to go to a new subject, just want to keep everybody aware that one of you will probably have to defer on this limestone topic kind of defer to the other in terms of if we're able to move on to the next topic if we oh, don't yes, want to sure. talk about I, I, can defer. I can defer right now the, the i just the last thing i would say is that i wasn't talking about flocculites i was talking about flocules which are small uh uh sort of tradition they're like very novel characteristics of sediment that has been deposited by moving water no, nothing to do with lightning nothing to do with any of that flocules. They're mentioned in both of the studies that I've seen you uh, traditionally link with regards to Okay. Food. Okay. I, I didn't, because uh, you, you said flocu, uh, flocculites. I said uh, I, I, I believe you said, okay, well, perhaps I was wrong. Now, you mentioned angular inconformities. You say there's no explanation for that uniformitarianism. The truth is, there's, uh, I mean, uh, in, in catastrophism, the, the truth is, you can't get an angular conformity, unconformity in uniformitarianism, and I'll explain again why. An angular conformity, if I could screen share one, I'll show you exactly why that's true. You, you cannot explain an angular unconformity with, with uniformitarianism because uh, the material, it, it's irrational to believe that a, a series of sedimentary strata come in by moving water and literally shear solid rock flat, right? It, it, and, and so that you have, uh, an angular inconformity. That that's just not plausible. Um, let me let me show you exactly what I'm talking about, so you'll understand. Because I I, I want for you to be able to see what I'm what, you, what I'm talking about. Let me screen share this image with you, if sure. I can. And, if I and can while do that. while you're while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and say we see erosion of every single type. We have erosion that creates beautiful arches out west. We have erosion that creates new riverbeds. And this is all stuff that happens from, you know, very quickly to very, quickly. very slowly, depending on what's going on. So I don't so, understand why shearing flat is problematic. You have a technical paper on that? I'm going to explain. Firstly, you don't get sedimentary strata very, very slowly. You get a layer of solid material, but it's but it, it it's not it, uh, it doesn't have the properties of sedimentary strata. What you're seeing on the screen now is an angular inconformity. Uh, obviously, the strata on the on the series uh, on the bottom, this formation on the bottom, is uh, at a different angle from the one on the top. Now, uh, under uniformitarianism, uh, the strata formation on the bottom was solid rock when the when the materials at the top were deposited on top of it. That can't be true because I'm sorry, you see how fine the, and flat the boundary is between them? That's only going to happen if the strata below, the formation below, were soft, moist sediments that could easily be eroded by rapid moving the water. And then comes another sedimentary strata, which has a fine, distinct boundary, which observable, testable science in the laboratory proves happens rapidly by moving water. So and again, then right on top of it, I would love for you to explain okay. uh, explain this to me. Explain this to me, please. Okay. Yes. How in the world a solid formation of okay. solid rock? I'd love to do that. Okay. I'm how, I, 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 let me let me ask the question first. How a solid formation of rock gets eroded to such a fine, distinct boundary? And since we know sedimentary strata de deposit with fine, distinct boundaries in rapidly moving water, explain to me how a vast period of time can possibly explain a, an, an angular inconformity. So angular unconformities, to my knowledge, first of all, these fine, thin layers that you're talking about, again, that's just bedding. That happens if you go outside and fill up a jar with water and put like different soils in it and shake it up, you no. get paper thin boundaries. You do. No. I've done it myself. And if I, if I still not, have my thing. That's not how stratiform. Well, allow me to continue. Now, allow me to continue. So erosion, like I said before you pulled up this picture, happens in a myriad of different ways and can create pretty much every kind of, of formation that you can imagine from gorgeous arches in the West, all the way to 
enormous caverns or sorry chasms like the Grand Canyon or the the uh, they're called the, I think the Hallelujah Mountains out in in China. But the fact of the matter is with with heat pressure and time, which are the three classic elements of, of geology, sorry, of conventional geology, you can get just about any kind of erosional, of erosional formation that you need. Now, I, I get that it, it seems kind of strange. It seems very beautiful, actually, that it's so precise and, and cut clean like that. And you think to yourself, well, you know, how, how do you get, you know, all of these, all of these layers that look like they were made in like a sand art toy? Um, and part of that comes from the fact that not all of those materials that have deposited are made up of the same thing. In fact, if you go to that picture that you just showed, hate to bring it back to this, but I get, I bet you, you will find some limestone layers in there. So the question would be on my end is not with the angular unconformity, which I explained with just simple erosion. I don't know why, like, it's cool that that seems incredulous to some people, but everything that I've seen and, and learned in like basic geol or, yeah, geology is that erosion is pretty much one of the most powerful forces when it comes to shaping any kind of rock, as long as there's enough time. That's the key thing. So when you're working within a small time frame, like, like say 6,000 years, right? Um, it may seem quite strange that you can get these kinds of formations. Um, now go back, go to the next picture, the one with the folding. Well, I, I will, but let me address what you just said. Yes, by all means. The, the problem with that is this, Erica. The same process that produced the the found uh, the formation on the bottom is the process that produced the one on top. And the ones that were produced on the bottom were produced by rapid deposition. And well, the no, ones that no, produced no, on the top were, for, were formed by rapid dis deposition. But that's not How we know that is process. this. Because they have a fine, distinct, flat boundary between each of those strata. See, so the ones at the bottom, pay attention now, the ones at the bottom formation all formed rapidly, and this is demonstrated in the laboratory, that's a geologic fact. The ones at the top formed the same way. So the boundary between them also formed the same way. Okay, rapidly so you, okay you, you, now it can't yeah. it, it, let me finish you've been on okay. you've been talking for two and a half minutes three well, minutes you have, you've done some long stretches okay. as well okay so here's the problem since we know from geology experimentation the uh, 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 sedimentary uh, uh, experimentation that the strata formed by rapid deposition which kills all evolution and uniformitarianism right there done Right. Since it, the, since the ones at the bottom form that way, and the ones at the top form that way, then the one that cuts across at the angle was also formed that way. Okay, so there is no uniformitarianism here. There are no millions of years you can insert. Okay. Where are you going to squeeze in your millions of years? Okay, so now that it's now that yes, sure. So now that this is on me, I want to. I don't know why we. I keep repeating this, but the thing is, is that those experiments that you are appealing to once again, have only been done with mud, stone, and shale. There are dozens upon dozens of different colors in this very picture. Not all of them are, are mud, stone, and shale, the things that you require that are the only ones that we know can be deposited by, by rapidly moving water, which is what you need for your model. Now, for my model, there are hundreds of, well, maybe not hundreds, dozens of different ways that things can be deposited in different areas, be it by the wind, be it by water, be it by, by le catastrophic local events, however you want to put it, you know, but, but, you know, you're acting as if this is like a slam dunk when you haven't even proven that anything other than mudstone and shale can be deposited by rapidly moving water, which is by definition, the major part of your model. So nothing you can say, unless you have like, a technical source that I'm perhaps not aware of that or a creationist source that has done the experimentation on one of the dozens of other minerals that are in that very picture, then I'm not on board with rapidly depositing sediment. I'm just not. You can say it as much as you want, but it hasn't been demonstrated, so it's not science. Um, and that's uh, all I have to say about it. Well, I think you need to do some more investigation. What I'm sharing on the screen are sedimentation experiments that have been performed all the way back since the 1950s. And uh, the results are consistent, and a variety of materials have been used. Uh, the only observation we see is that strata can form by rapid deposition. That's it. And when when a local flood occurs, uh, such as a um, uh, famous geologist McGee noticed during a local flood, twelve particular in, in Colorado, I believe it was, uh, when a river overflowed it flowed its banks, twelve feet of sedimentary strata were created in twenty in forty eight hours. Twelve feet, and that happened, and that was various materials, 
and over and very rapidly. I have not heard you explain to us how you're going to squeeze millions of years in between these sedimentary strata with these fine distinct boundaries. As one material becomes less available to the environment and another material becomes available. See, this is, this is something you must be able to explain if you're going to claim that uniformitarianism explains the geologic column. No okay. scientist on this earth can do it. I challenge you to do it. Okay. Tell me, tell me this, Erica, how is it plausible to believe that there's millions of years time when we see one strata with a pre of, comprised of a predominantly one material abruptly ends and paper thin boundary than only another? Why is there no gradation? Why is it instantaneous if what we observe in the earth doesn't match exactly what's done in the laboratory okay so gotcha. setting cool. the timer for two minutes and we're going to go back and forth with two minute intervals perfect that that is fine by me so a couple of things on that one these paper thin layers that you're suggesting are not there in all kinds of strata i know in your conversation with corp he showed you some they call it interfingering which is uh, essentially um a, a means to look at how things are overlapping at angles um but but all of that aside the basic concept of geology and of deposition is that things form on top of other things and that area in between is like it's like bedding right again i don't i don't know how many times i can kind of like say this i guess and and get across my point rather but that for those bedding those paper thin layers form whether something is depositing incredibly slowly like the limestone we see depositing right now every year in any sort of coral reef area or when things happen quickly like for example with your river flooding so so having layers isn't exclusive to to this this form of rapidly rapid burial or rapid sedimentation and the fact of the matter is you said mud overflowed the river, so I'm imagining it's probably mudstone, which can be deposited quite quickly into 12 layers or 12 feet or whatever it is that you said. Show me a single example where something other than the two classic creationist linked experiments of the two things that can be deposited rapidly, or two things that can be deposited rapidly and have the marks that they have been deposited rapidly in the form of those little noticeable structures called flocules, not the flocculites, the lightning things, but the structures that are found and rapidly deposited, deposited deposited sediment due to rapidly moving water. Oh, okay. it, it's absent. Hold on, I didn't get my two minutes. It's absent in all of the all of the uh, viable strata that has to do with anything that deposits slowly, first of all. Now, completely separated from that, it is completely demonstrably false that the only way things are deposited is by water. Wind deposits things as well. We get particles from the Sahara Desert in Brazil that's blown all the way over across the entire Atlantic Ocean, Time. all the way over in Brazil. So, it, you know, there are more than one means to deposit. That's my point. Okay. Flocules can be explained by, uh, uh, during the flood, the, the, the flood didn't happen instantaneously across the earth. It happened in, in pieces. Uh, an area would become inundated and the area is rising because of geological movement in the continent. It's rising and gets inundated a second time, bearing a flaculite. So, but you didn't answer the question. You see this, you said predominantly one material. This, these strata that you're seeing right here are comprised of different materials. That's why they're predominantly different colors, uh, 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 you see. So when you say they, they're comprised of predominantly one, one material, that, that's not true. These strata are comprised of very different materials, and the, paper, the boundary between them is fine as paper. Now, as I pointed out, that can't happen under uniformitarianism. It only happens in the laboratory rapidly, and that's what we observe, and it's exactly what we see throughout the geologic column. This kills uniformitarianism. There is no way for you to squeeze millions of years in them. There isn't. Now, you mentioned uh, limestone again. You bring keep bringing up limestone. It takes millions of years, so you think, for limestone. Then can you explain to me why we find fossils of fish completely articulate? fossils of fish in limestone because here's your idea the limestone is is burying at a rate of one to two centimeters per thousand years at just like with uh with chalk right so if that's true can you explain to us why a fish is going to lay on the ocean floor for two thousand two thousand not two thousand years let's say uh, uh, but not four thousand it's got to be buried by enough of the material that is compacted under its own weight 
to, to seal off the, the creature and prevent earth uh, ocean floor worms from eating it, scavengers from getting it. Are you telling us that it's plausible that a complete fish can die, lay on the ocean floor, and be buried at a rate of one to two centimeters per thousand years by limestone material and remain a fossil? How does that work? Erica. Okay. How, how does that work? Now, I haven't had two minutes yet, but you okay. need to be able to explain to us why it's plausible for anybody to believe that, that limestone can only form by uniformitarian time when we have fossils in limestone, or completely articulate ones, in fact, like sea creatures. I'm sorry, but I'm just going to tell you, if a fish dies and lays on the ocean floor, it won't be there in three months. It won't be, it's not likely to be there in a month. A whale can die. This has been verified by GPS going back to the location where the whale was. Whale dies on the ocean floor. Six months later, it's half gone. One year later, there's nothing, not even a shred of bone, nothing. It's been completely devoured by scavengers. But you want us to believe that we have to believe that limestone forms over millions of years at such a ridiculous low rate absolutely, when it has fossils in it absolutely i do because it's never been demonstrated otherwise now one i i just explained to you an example um yeah so so i have i'm not a paleontologist that's for certain now if you can show me in a in a pure limestone deposit a fish fossil i would be very interested i would be I would find it fascinating, but not insofar as I find it impossible. Because the thing is, is that limestone is limestone is deposited when it's still very, very soft. Yeah, fossil fish in limestone. Mm, that is a cool fossil. Yeah, there are fossils in limestone. Yeah, I, I was not aware because, again, I'm not a paleontologist. But you have to remember that when things are deposited, they're not deposited and then they become rock instantly. They can slough off of things, the sides of canyons, whatever, underwater canyons and the like. So I have no idea how that specific fossil was formed. But what I do know is that underwater landslides in both models <laughs> do occur. And limestone is not immediately hardened the second it ends up on the ground. In fact, it requires compaction and cementation before it's actually a hard rock. So there's the... There I mean, you might not find that to be, you know, the answer that you want. Um, and I would also need to look into the particulars of that fossil and see if it truly is a, a pure limestone fossil as, as it's being proposed here. Um, but the fact remains that uh, no matter how many times you, you want to say it, there is no mechanism for limestone or chalk or any of these fine minerals. I focus on limestone because it's the one that I know. But there's dozens of minerals that simply can't deposit quickly. They've never been demonstrated to, not with the Washington Scablins flood, not with local floods, no, nothing, or like even more local floods, nothing of that nature. But if, if it wasn't clear from my presentation, the most, the most damning thing that I find for flood geology or the, low, the, the flood in general is your immense problem with heat. You know, whether you look at Walt Brown or catastrophic plate tectonics, it doesn't matter. You, no one in the flood, you can have the, the, the best boat in the world made of titanium out there. It is going to be instantly vaporized along with the crust of the planet because of the sheer amount of heat released, not just from the, the fountains of the deep bursting forth. And because it's under such great amounts of pressure, it is going to be superheated, as you said. But also from the accelerated radiometric decay that you need, also from the friction from the continents moving. And believe it or not, when things like, uh, like sandstone and limestone harden, they release heat too. So I'd like to know how you explain that. Well, I, I can't explain the heat problem, uh, but uh, as I said, I don't have a problem with there being issues that can't be explained. What I do like to talk about are things that can be explained, like these fish fossils in limestone. Now, I'm just going to tell you, Erica, it can't be that a fish dies, falls on the ocean floor, and limestone is deposited on top of it at a rate of one to two inches or centimeters per thousand years. That's not possible. There would be no fish. There can be no fossil form that way. I don't know how you came to believe this. I think because you need to believe that these happen, these things happen, the limestone and other rocks have to form over vast geologic time. I've demonstrated with the fine distinct boundaries of the strata that they all formed rapidly, the whole geologic column. But this is, it, it just kills your idea. There's no way for that fish or any other fossil of a fish or any creation, any other brachiopods, anything else found in limestone to exist because I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a little heads up here. You can't have a fish or any other animal die, fall on the ocean floor, and then remain there for a vast age of time. It will be consumed. But so your rescue device for this is, well, uh, an underwater landslide fixed up. 
Well, this is what the rescue device used by uniformitarians all the time to explain, to explain uh, fossil dinosaurs in sandstone and uh, other creatures in sandstone. That it's, it's always turning to, uh, well, uh, you know, an underwater landslide buried that creature. Oh, so what about that one over there? Well, that was an underwater landslide too. Well, what about that one way over there, 2,000 miles away? Well, that was an underwater landslide. I'm sorry, Erica. It's just not plausible to believe that the whole continent was covered by continuous underwater landslides. That's just not a plausible. The rescue device doesn't work. This is what we know. Ten seconds. Limes, the creatures are in limestone. They can't be there unless they were buried rapidly. That's all there is to that. You haven't explained how millions of years can be between strata um, that have a fine, distinct boundary, and you never will. Okay, so a couple of things on that. One, there are, I've explained both of these things to you. You just don't like the explanation, and that's fine, but I don't think you're justified, even though I feel as if you might continue to say it. I don't personally feel as if you're justified in saying, you haven't explained this. The better way of putting it is, I don't think that explanation is viable, which is fine, but, but I certainly think that local catastrophes, which have been a, a hallmark of, of geology since actualism was invented. You know, I mean, local catastrophes have, have, to my knowledge, since actualism never been precluded from the idea of uniformitarianism, which is why it was renamed actualism in the first place. So when you've got 4.8 billion with a B years, you think there's not going to be a couple dozen landslides that catch a couple dozen critters? I, I find that just statistically unbelievable. Now, you can say to me that you don't have a problem with the heat or whatever, uh, but the fact remains that your entire model is physically impossible on every single level until you find a way to mitigate that heat. Now you can call it a rescuing device to, to say, you know, there are landslides or to refer to cross bedding, both of which are, are actual just regular things that happen in geology that we see today, as you mentioned with your example with the river, we get landslides and we get volcanism and we get these kinds of, of localized events and they catch critters in them. So I, I you know, I'm, I'm at a loss to me, it feels like you, you you know, felt like you had a grip on this thing about a fish and limestone, and you think that that's somehow a gotcha. I mean, I'm not even a geologist, and, and I know how something like that could have formed. You just don't like the explanation. And, and of course, I can point to you and say, you really and truly have not provided an explanation for, for the heat problem. Not even an attempt. You just said, no, we don't know, which, by the way, I respect. I think, I, I think that it's, it's, honest to say when you don't know the answer. I try my best to Ten do the seconds. same. I mean, like I said, I'm not a paleontologist. I don't know the details of how this fish and limestone formed, but I can come up with a, a feasible idea. Um, but even that is lacking from even the best creationists Time. on the job for the heat problem. Okay, so I'm trying to screen share a picture here. Um, so I, I, think, I, I think I've shown, I've explained that uh, only rapid inundation uh, can explain the geologic column, the strata, their fine distinct boundaries. And I've shown that uh, uh, having a fossil in limestone demonstrates the creature had to have been buried rapidly in a massive amount of the stuff it can't have sustained for thousands of years, uh, waiting for you know several feet of it to be compacted. Um, now, I'm, I'm off to this because I'm going to show you this. Evolutionists say, well, how did kangaroos, if creation is true, how'd they get off the ark and get to, to Australia? Well, you should probably investigate land bridges because that's probably the explanation. Land bridges, the creatures migrated. And evolutionists say, well, kangaroos, they evolved in, uh, in Australia. They couldn't have migrated because we only find fossils of them in Australia. Well, this is University of Madras archaeologist Jinu Koshi. And he discovered that in India, the uh, the people of India drew were were rock rock uh, creating rock art of kangaroos in India. Now, the, sure, we know that the uh, Aust the uh, kangaroos didn't migrate from Australia to India. Well, they had to have been in India before they got to Australia. So this shows migration, and it kills the idea that the evolutionist has that the creature had to have evolved in Australia because we've got a man-made rock art by ancient men of kangaroos in India. This is a new discovery. It just was made just this week. Uh, so um, 
I, you know, that I think provides a, an explanation that the uniformitarianist, uh, the evolutionist idea that creatures exist in one location only because they evolved there and they don't exist anywhere else because we don't find their fossil somewhere else in the geologic column. Uh, it, it, it puts a, throws a, a, a screw into that a cog of gears, you know. So there is no problem with biodiversity uh, and, and uh, bio, biogeological diversity. I, I don't see that as a problem. What I do find a problem is having a fossil and a strata if it formed over millions of years. Okay. So, and again, as, as I said, I've, I've given an explanation for the fish and limestone. I'm sure the people in chat are doing an excellent job uh, uh, putting that more concisely than I did. Um, but if you don't like it, you don't like it. I can't, I can't control what is convincing to people as an explanation. Um, I do know that as far as parsimony goes, um, you're, you, you guys have a lot of problems as far as ecologic or hydrologic sorting explaining the order of the fossils of the fossil record. We don't find a single mammal uh, below the, um, below like for instance in like um, uh, Carboniferous or perhaps Devonian, whatever. There's no rabbit in the Cambrian, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, things have moved around 100%. I will be the first one to tell you that science changes constantly, and that's what makes it so cool. But the problem is the Earth keeps getting older, not younger, and as just like a complete side note. As far as this kangaroo picture, I think it's a cool picture. I don't think it's a kangaroo. I think that's about as viable as an explanation as I've seen some people try to propose things that look vaguely like dinosaurs, proving that humans lived with dinosaurs. People draw pictures of minotaurs. People draw pictures of lion-headed men. People draw pictures of cyclops. People draw pictures of a lot of things, and they make a lot of them up. I don't think that it's even possible to, to parse out, based off of cave art, what is legitimate and what is not, unless it's, it's you know, very, very detailed, which I don't find that picture to be. Funnily enough, though, we do find cave art that does depict um, mastodons and things of this nature, um, but... but I don't. I just don't think if you're looking for for an explanation to get your kangaroos to Australia, you I think might want to look into that land bridge a little bit too. Because I I used to get coffee with the young Earth creationist, and and he brought up that same thing one time. So I did look into it. There is zip zilch nada support for a land bridge 4,400 years ago spanning between Australia and and the the um, the main continent of um, Asia, Europe, and Africa, or the subcontinent of India, wherever you want it to be. It's just not there. But we. Can find a land bridge. Oh, is that time? Sorry, James. You got five to ten seconds. Okay, uh, but we do find a land bridge where the Bering Strait was. That's it. Well, there's secular well, science. Just want to let everybody know we will go into Q and A pretty sh pretty quickly here. I'm trying to remember. I think we started with Neff. So what we'll do is we'll give Neff a two minute interval right now, and then we'll do one for Erica, and then we'll go into the Q and A. Okay, so there are uh, secular geologists who believe there was a land bridge there, like there was in, the, in Bering Strait. Um, I, I find it bizarre that you believe that it's possible that everywhere we look, there has to have been a, 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 an underwater uh, a landslide that covered the fossil. The, every every fossil, not just uh, this fossil or that one, but whales and all kinds of things, uh, where evolutionists, where they can't be if uniformitarianism is true. The, the simple fact is, we don't see evolution in the, in the fossil record. I mean, this this is about the, the flood of Noah and the ark, okay? It's not about paleontology specifically. But I'll just point out that there are literally uh, virtually every prominent evolutionist scientist who has written books about paleontology acknowledges the geologic column is absent of the transitional forms expected by evolution theory. Nearly every single one of them, and I'm providing on stream uh, uh, just uh, such examples from Niles Eldridge, Stephen Jay Gould, once the died in the late 90s, once the world's foremost paleontologist, David B. Kitts, professor of geology, University of uh, uh, the list goes on and on and on. If I was to read all of them to you, and just at the normal pace that I'm speaking now, it would take me about five minutes to get through them all. So, and these are in the books that evolutionist scientists write for their peers to read, not for the general public so much. So, there just isn't any evidence of evolution in in the rocks of the earth. I think I've shown that. I'm sorry. Is it time? Okay. Well, I I, I think I've shown a strong case for the for, for the Ark of Noah being a, a viable uh, uh, vessel that would uh, be able to withstand the oceans of the Noahic flood, uh, and historical evidence that men wrote of a historical global flood, and those those legends are in virtually every culture of the whole world earlier i know that sentinel apologetics i saw you did two i think dave gar i know you did one 
if you can tag me, because I definitely, that's kind of the, the purpose of like the engagement with Super Chat. So I do want to read those. And so really sorry, I've never had YouTube do this. Usually I can just pull up a list in my creator studio and I just read through the list in order. But right now, YouTube is just not putting them in there. Uh, so it's been a rough night. But thanks for your patience, folks. We're going to kick it over to Erica. And, so wait, are these closing statements? Um, not per se, more just continued two-minute intervals. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. All right, so I'll go ahead. Um, no transitional fossils. That, to me, I know this is a bit rude, I guess, but I find that notion laughable, particularly because creationists all across the board recognize that transitional fossils are a thing, including like Todd Wood, right? And that they look like transitional fossils. They just say that they aren't transitional fossils. And, and even some of them, like for instance, Todd Wood, are, are kind of at a loss for, for, for what to do with them, right? I mean, he doesn't know where to draw the line on, on where which prehistoric horse kind beget it all, or whether it was Indohias or Pachycetus that started the cetaceans. He thinks there were no cetaceans essentially in the water or that they re-evolved after the ark and that Noah took a Pachycetus or Ambulocetus on board. Um, so, you know, you don't want to talk about transitional fossils, certainly, but if, if we do, we should have a discussion about evolution. I mean, I definitely assisted in derailing this conversation to where it is now. Um, but yeah, fossils form today. They they absolutely 100% form today. Now, guys like Kent Hovind say that they don't. They absolutely do. Um, the thing is, is that we, we find them in a myriad of different ways from alkaline lakes. We find them fossilizing there. We find them fossilizing or rather preserving in bogs. We find them, you know, doing all sorts of things, getting frozen and yes, getting buried. The, the thing is, if something's buried, you're not going to see it, are you? Because it's all trapped there underground. Um, so yes, fossils do 100% still form today. I can absolutely provide a source in the comments for that as well, uh, because that's just not true. And, and no, they don't just form by rapid deposition either, because again, we have tar pits, we have alkaline lakes, we have all sorts of different means by which fossils can form. My my whole thing here is that, to me, I can't even begin to entertain the, the, the arc situation, the global flood situation, with the enormous heat problem and with the fact that it just completely lacks a viable model in general. Like, there's the catastrophic plate tectonics and there's the hydroplate, and they don't agree on pretty much anything. Um, even Walt Brown is aware of the enormous uh, release of energy that he has to account for for ejecta leaving Earth and then coming back and hitting it again. Um, so no, that I, I, I remain entirely unconvinced on, on any of that. I think that there needs to be something empirical and you know, for their best efforts, we haven't seen anything. Um, and that's all I have to say. Gotcha. And as mentioned, we were going to do those final two minute uh, intervals with that. And we were going to jump into the Q&A. So what I would like to do is just quick remind everybody, so sorry, folks, that by the way, for the record, somebody let me know. I appreciate it. Somebody mentioned that Fight the Flat Earth was streaming today and he had the same problem where he could not find the list of super chats in his creator studio. So it's YouTube. I told you guys. Okay, so anyway, um, so sorry about that. But let's see. Dave Gar, thanks for your super chat. This is one that I, I think he had said before. I do have like one or two. Yeah, that's right. I had Steven Steen. Sorry, bro. I know that you sent one or two as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people that I'm so sorry we lost them because I can't on the stream that we started on tonight as well, I went over there to see if I could scroll through the chat and the chat is processing still, so I can't. So we're up a crick. So sorry, folks. Uh, it's been a long night. But thanks for your super chat from Steven Steen, who says, oh, that's right. I do remember him saying this. Says, Neff is the greatest scientist of all time. <laughs> Thank you for that. You got a fan out there, Neff. Well, uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> gotcha. Well, thank you very much. Dave Gar, thanks for your super chat, said, <clears throat> I just wanted you to do a Darth Dawkins impression and say, were these interlocutors even screened, James? Uh, that's funny. I was listening to a video of Darth today. It was making me laugh. But thanks to your super chat from Kalub. I know that you asked one. I'm trying to remember. I think it was James. How can I be as cool as you? Very sad. It's like, hang in there, buddy. Okay, I made that one up. But next up, I do have a couple of real ones here. Let's see. Tioga, thanks for your super chat. Who said Erica is an alpha? <laughs> You've well, I try not to be a 
Beta. That's right. <laughs> I like that. Very good, Erica. So, uh, let's see. I know Sentinel Apologetics. I know you sent one. I'm so sorry. Robert Luscombe, I remember you sent one as well. Thanks for your recent one, Robert, who said, Neff, a simple Google search shows a flourishing civilization in Mesopotamia between 2500 BC and 2300 BC, with no mention of their entire civilization being destroyed by a flood. Please explain. Uh, it's That's easily explained. Uh, the secular timeline for the Egyptians and the uh, Babylonian uh, 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 fertile crescent uh, is always uh, stretched out. Evolutionists have a habit of stretching out uh, historical timelines uh, that add a century here and three centuries there. And the further go back you go back in history, the more time they add. Now it becomes 500 years, then 1,000, then 10,000, then 100,000, then millions. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of assumptions that go on in, in that camp with that, and they leave out, uh, ignore a lot of other information that uh, makes a case against it. So I, I, their, their timelines is what's wrong. Gotcha. And thanks for your James, super chat. Is this one of those ones where we respond to each other's, or should I just not? Are we running low on time? I, I think we'd drag this thing out for another 45 sure. minutes if we did that. <laughs> a little short on time. I would normally give you guys like a quick rebuttal on at least some, but just to try to cruise through as many as we can. Sorry yeah, about okay. that. I no, know no, that no. you've got a round in the chamber ready to fire back. I know I get passionate enough, but I, I, I really do just enjoy the conversation so much. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. Well, I do too. I'll send you a list of those fossil quotes. Yeah, by, by the, okay, because there's so many. Mm, I would actually like to, to read them. That would be great. We'd send allow, me an email. We'd allow you guys to do a rebuttal, but only if you call each other a beta. So <laughs> thanks for your super chat. Dave Gar, who said, please add a limestone chunk for the thumbnail. So true. We really should. I will do that yeah, for tomorrow. That's as fair enough. We will be premiering this debate in its entirety. So we will stitch the two pieces together and re-release it tomorrow for Throwback Thursday. So that, that'll be early in the morning. So Daniel G, or Daniel, yes, Daniel G603, thanks for your super chat, said, If I know Neff the way I think I do, he will gracefully accept defeat and never debate again. Rest in peace, legend. I would just say uh, the projection. Uh, I, I don't think it's possible for the truth to lose a debate, so I don't think I lose any. Thanks. I don't see how the physical evidence can be refuted. You got it. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. And next up, I think I saw another one. Hold on one sec. Very embarrassing, folks. Uh, you know, just barely hanging together, kind of building the plane as it takes off tonight. Let's see. We yep, yeah, we got that. And yes, I do want to remind you, though, folks. Oh, we do have. So before I read this next super chat from Josiah Hansen, I want to remind you, both the speakers linked in the description, waiting for you. And Josiah Hansen, thanks for your super chat. Said in parentheses in the Lego Movie, Erica is awesome. <laughs> thanks for singing it, James. That I, I hearing hearing you start that sentence, I was like, God, I hope he sings it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I wish I knew the actual song, but that's good. And let's see. Tioga thinks I have my own songs. Somebody wrote a song about me. It's on the internet. It's on YouTube. <laughs> you serious? I yeah, years ago, you know. Uh, I'll definitely check it out, Neff. I promise. We will premiere it tomorrow during the debate that it plays on this channel. I'm kidding. My, is it a good song or is it a, is it a critical song? Oh, it's you know it's it's ridiculing. You know. Oh, sassy. Gotcha. Oh, was it G-Man that was he rapping? No, no, no. I don't even remember who did it, but it was like eight or nine years ago, I think. Does G-Man rap? G-Man does have rap songs. You got to check it out on his channel. I'm totally serious. Oh, my God. I yes, mean... it's awesome. So, yes, uh, thanks so much for, let's see, Tioga, who said, mine said, Erica is an alpha. That's really what my super chat said. Yeah, we totally got that one, Tioga. Duh. But thanks. I think that was an older message. Thanks for your patience, Tioga. And want to say thanks so much, everybody, for being patient with us during the serious tech issues, both with YouTube partly being to blame, but also... It's true. I have no idea what did it. I've never had Streamlabs just all of a sudden just boom, shut down. But that's what happened earlier tonight. Very embarrassing. Did you know Erica, when we were off air, laughed at me? 
Jeez. Okay. So I made that up. Thanks, Adam Elbilia, for your question. Says, that's awesome how you're not embarrassed to show your face after your humiliating de 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 humiliation debating against Tom Jump. After, and then in parentheses, after whatever he says, if any, all the love man. Well, thank you very much. Those those debilitating losses to D Jump, I, I still haven't recovered from. It's been over a year, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Actually, if you want to know the truth, though, okay, but thanks for your, uh, let's see, we have a Patreon question from Brian Stevens. Thanks for your question. Said, can Neff give the names of these secular geologists who claim Australia had a land bridge? Specific names would help. And James Downard and I are wondering. Uh, I, I don't recall them off my uh, top of my head. I read a couple of articles in the major news media uh, several years back where uh, mainstream uh, scientists were speculating that there may have been a land bridge between Australia and Asia at a point in the past when the ocean levels were lower. I'm oh, wait. sorry, I can't, One... I can't cite the name at this time. One thing, um, I thought that Adam Albilia was giving me crap about my debates with Tom Jump like a year ago. In fact, he said he was talking about you, Neff. Oh, okay. So let me read it again, just so everybody knows the context. Okay, he said, that's awesome how you are not embarrassed to show your face, Nephilim Free, after your humiliation debating against Tom Jump. All the love, man. <laughs> yeah, well... Um, I, I honestly, uh, I, I think I've debated many stronger people than Tom Jump. I, 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 I didn't mean to go there, okay? I'm just oh being gosh. honest now. I'm being honest, okay? I'm just being honest. Oh, snap. Wait until Tom hears that. I'm going to tell him you said that, Neff. But thanks for your, yes, Sentinel Apologetics. T definitely type your question. That was your original site super chat because I appreciate you doing that. Totally appreciate the support. Um they said Noah did not, this is their super chat originally, said Noah did not build Ken Ham's Ark Nephilim free. And then they said the dimensions are base 60 numbers, not our base 10. Noah built a coracle boat out of reeds, not gigantic lumber. Well, that doesn't match uh, the physical evidence of the ge geologic uh, column, the flood, what would be necessary. And it doesn't match the scriptures, which are the primary source of information about the actual ark itself and how it was constructed. And it doesn't match rationale either uh, that, uh, that Noah would build. The, uh, since the, the, the flood legends of the world are global, since the geologic evidence of the geologic column has to have been produced by rapid inundation and, and sedimentology and can't be produced by uniformitarianism, I, I think it's implausible to believe the secular uh, crazy idea that Noah built some wingy dingy little thing out of reeds. Uh, that just doesn't wash. Next up. Thanks for your super chat. Sentinel Apologetics also said Genesis 6 14 reads, quote, Make for yourself a vessel of stalks from a reed hut. With reeds, you will make the vessel and tar it inside and out with bitumen. The Bible doesn't say reed. It says gopher wood. Whatever type of wood that was, we don't know. But it was made of wood, and it was made of tremendous, uh, tremendous size. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense from a historical point of view, from a geological point of view, and it doesn't match scripture about how it was constructed. Uh, it was constructed out of wood, not reeds. Gotcha. And thanks so much. Let's see. We uh, Hunter Rotham, thanks for your super chat, said, To Nephilim Free, what are your credentials? If you have less than Erica, why do you debate oh, her so confidently? Oh, yeah. I, I'm so glad they asked. Because it just happens to be that I have a PhD in every field of science from every university on every continent, on every planet, in every galaxy, in every solar system, of, in, in, of every universe, in all the multi-universes. I have them all. I, I, I have, in fact, stadiums stacked with diplomas. Hmm. I'll, I'll take a picture for you sometime. Well, now you all know. I was sassy. I liked that now. I was a fan. That's excellent. And let's see. Thanks for, let's see. I want to try to figure out if I missed any more. 
Uh, Michael Dresden just trolling. <laughs> let's see, there's got to be another one. Uh, let's see. I always wonder if Michael just copy and paste. But I do want to say, to respect the time of the debaters, especially because Nephilim Free, the reason we went early tonight is Neph actually has to get up super duper early. So we do want to rock and roll pretty quick here. But want to say thanks so much for our speakers for being here. They are what make the channel fun. The channel is... The lifeblood of it is the debaters. So we really appreciate them spending their time with us tonight. It was a lot of fun. And then this video, just so you know, because I know otherwise I'll get emails or something. The vi this video will disappear. I'll privatize it right after the stream ends. And then reattach the two pieces and premiere it tomorrow morning. Just so you're wondering, in case you're wondering, like, where did the, the video go? I want to leave a, a comment making fun of... Uh, Nephilim free. Well, don't worry, you'll get your chance tomorrow. And so I want to say thanks so much, folks. It's been a lot of fun. And thanks again, Erica and Neff. Hey, Thank always glad to be here. I had a good time. I again I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks, I, I, thanks for debating with me, Erica. I hope we can do it again. Yeah, and thanks for debating with me as well. Again, I I we, we just both get passionate, you know? It's a fun subject to talk about. It was a fun one. This is like people really, I, there was like a ton of positive feedback and a uh, ton of uh, likes as well. So thanks so much for that support of these speakers, everybody. And Michael, the Canadian atheist, thanks for your last minute super chat, said, The flood never happened. Grow up, Neff. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Well, the flood never happened. Then, then stop walking on the earth because you're standing on 1800 meters of sedimentary strata with fine distinct boundaries. What are you going to do? Make the earth disappear? Move to another planet if you don't like the flood. There gotcha. you go. There you go. Really quick. Uh, we had a couple of last minute, really quick ones. And then we really do just because I do want to, uh, I want to let Neff get to sleep at a decent time. Um, so we'll read these last two. Sentinel apologize. Thanks for your super chat. Said gopher is an Akkadian load word. Equals reed, not timber. Neff. That's not true. Hebraists disagree with that. Gotcha. Thanks for your super chat. Robert Luscombe, who said, Neff, what would change your mind? Uh, nothing. What? How? Uh, reality doesn't change. Therefore, my mind won't change. Gotcha. And by the way, folks, in case you had not heard, I am not able to find the uh, super chats in the creator studio. So Dildo Baggins, I saw you were asking if I read your super chat. I I'm so sorry. I like it. YouTube isn't showing it to me over here. I'm trying to refresh and it's still just not coming through, man, YouTube. But yeah, so uh, let me. Uh, yeah, still not coming through. Very embarrassing for but what we'll do is want to say thanks so much, everybody, for being here. It's always fun. And I sincerely apologize. I know there were some super chats that I missed, like Jen S. Uh, sorry, I, I knew you sent one, but I don't remember what it said. YouTube's monstrous with that. I Listen, email the question. I know I got none of the questions. Neff, Neff stole all the questions. But if, if you do have any questions for me, feel free to email me. I, I love answering this kind of stuff. So, so true. And she's got a channel, so you can post your questions as comments there. Whatever yeah, you know, come harass, me. come harass me on my channel. That's That'd right. Uh, so yeah, uh, Erica, email me. Don't forget to email me for. I don't. I don't points. have your email, Neff. James, do you have his email? Maybe could you? Send yeah, I mean, I can send it if Neff allows me. It's yeah, on like sure, top secret, do. double probation status, so I can. Yeah, I I put my credentials in. James, be quiet. You're not supposed Ooh. to talk about that. Keep it secret. Yeah. No. My credentials. You got oh, it. Gosh. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Come so, on. I'm, I'm trying to joke. Yeah, send her my email address. <laughs> and yes, that's right. I absolutely will do. And yes, tomorrow should be a lot of fun. Problem of Evil debate. That'll be Skylar Fiction and Reformed Boy. Or I should say Reformed Christian Apologist is his actual name. That's just his Twitter handle. So thanks so much, folks. We will see you hopefully tomorrow night or Friday night. I'm trying to remember. Friday night. Oh, Mark Drisdale is coming back. You should like this, you guys. I hope you get a kick out of it. It's going to be on whether or not Trump has handled the pandemic properly. So Mark Drisdale is going to be arguing no. And then the general, you guys have probably seen him. He sends a, a question or a super chat here and there. General Ballsack will be here with us. And so that's his real name. It's what it says on his birth certificate. Well, not the general part. But anyway, thanks for your... 
Oh, let's say Dildo Baggins, thanks for your uh, super chat, as well as uh, helping us stay professional here, Dildo Baggins. It says, ask Neff, why is Dimetrodon found below Mosasaurus? Um, well, I could throw that back and say, why do we find dinosaur fossils on the surface of the Earth? The evolutionist uses a rescue device. Well, well that was a uh, underwater uh, landslide. Oh, well, that was because erosion took the land away over there. They have lots of uh, rescue devices. And uh, we don't find rabbits with dinosaurs and humans either. And we don't find lots of creatures that evolutionists expect to find in the same strata with other creatures. So it's cherry picking because we don't find this one with that that means uniformitarianism is true but they don't talk about the ones that we don't find that we should according to their ideas gotcha we will let you go folks it's been super fun and we'll let nephilim free get to sleep thanks erica and neff 